This presentation will be discussing building the case for dam and levees. The outline today is we're going to go through some objectives, some key concepts, uh, evaluate how we establish confidence in our claims and use uncertainty, and how we arrange evidence to support our argument and recommendations and a coherence check or what we usually call a gut check or something like that. So starting off with objectives and key concepts. So how do we learn how to build a case? We need to show how we integrate information into a coherent argument. Explain that the case is more than just numbers. It's built on our knowledge of how a particular dam, levy, or a pertinent structure could fail. Um, we are going to provide evidence to support to support those arguments and focus on what the most compelling evidence is. We need to include our confidence in what those claims are, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as this presentation goes on. And we want to make sure that we avoid the temptation of presenting a balanced perspective and present, and what I mean by that is avoid the temptation of trying to balance the list of positive and negatives if that is not the reality of the case or the risk or the project that we're evaluating. Uh, this is not meant to be a balanced case. You present what the case is based on the facts, whether those facts are positive or negative, and then you make the recommendations based on that information that you are presenting. So the dam safety case is a logical set of arguments used to advocate a position that either a safety related action, so some kind of corrective action is justified or that no additional action is needed. The dam safety case is intended to present a rationale in a formal and methodical manner so we can persuade decision makers to take some action. And in this case, we would expect that to be a responsible action. The decision makers are going to rely on that technical staff and the way that we provide that information to build the case to be able to make these decisions. Who those decision makers are can vary depending on the agency that you're working with or um, uh, just the, the project that you're working on. So there might be different requirements based on, on that. What we're doing is convincing the decision makers that the dammer structure can withstand future loading, that the risk estimate is logical, and that, that corrective actions are necessary and coherent. We should evaluate uncertainty in that risk estimate and claims that we're making as a team, and should address what our confidence in that assessment and whether new information might change the course of action. The dam safety case becomes the basis for the risk for risk management in the effect that it has on the actions that we take as an agency. It does not ensure the safety of the dam, but it does inform our actions and decisions that we take from that point forward. So what should be our strategy here? So it requires some creativity and some judgment and several potentially simple arguments, but that are strung together to form a coherent argument to build this dam safety case that certain actions should be taken or not taken. Do not, do not just take the bullets from the more and less likely factors. You want to make sure that you are writing, I know this sounds pretty simple, but writing complete sentences, using paragraph forms, uh, that you're basically telling the story of the failure mode and why that failure mode drives risk at the dam that you're evaluating. So where we get the evidence to build the case, uh, this can be very project specific. So I'm going to go through and just in add all these in the slide. These can be very project specific. So don't just look at this list as like just something that you that you're going to have available, particularly for every project. But normally we use case histories of failures and successes. We use site characterization information, the geologic details of the dam. 
We can use empirical data that we have available to us. Um, design uh, analysis that was used at the time of construction and changes to design presidences that we have uh, have at the core or the agency that you're working on. Design details, key defenses, um, and I'll give you an example of that later on in the presentation. Construction details, how the dam has performed. Has it had good performance? Has it bad performance? What does instrumentation tell us? Examples on what the district or, or agency has seen in past performance during flood conditions, uh, flood fighting. Uh, has there been seepage? What locations did those seepage occur? Uh, has there been cracking, for example? Just there is a so, whole list of things that we can use to establish the performance of the dam, whether it has been uh, good or bad. Uh, analysis, original design analysis, any kind of analysis that has been done since then. Uh, we can use other potential failure mode analysis and risk analysis as, as examples or information that we can build upon for the dam that we are evaluating. Um, other examples of poor performance of structures that are designed in a similar manner. And then um, construction photos, of course, are always very useful and drawings. Make sure that you're always looking at historical information for that dam that you're evaluating. So moving on to confidence and claims and uncertainty. Um, confidence claims, confidence and claims made to build a case are derived from the logic of those arguments. And then the strength of that evidence that we have when we're building that case. Um, make sure that you're using sensitivity analysis, for example, to show how different information or different assumptions within certain parameters can change the case. And it can strengthen your confidence in the decision that you're putting forth to those decision makers. Uh, make sure that you're showing how that additional information can change the perceived risk, whether it can be up or down, and how that graphs against our tolerable risk guidelines. Um, uncertainty in building the case is expressed as a range of the mean of the expected value and is demonstrated. Uh, and I'll show you kind of that, how we can demonstrate that through the FN chart. Um, we can use our probabilistic analysis to help us build the confidence and show uncertainty in our risk estimate. And especially when we're eliciting our failure modes, we actually can also not only just elicit the expected, the expected values, but we can also, or the most likely values, but we can also elicit what we believe the upper and lower bands, bounds are to be able to establish that uncertainty as a team. So those uncertainties can be established through analysis or through elicitation. So arranging evidence to support the argument. So how do we arrange that evidence really should follow the formula for risk, which we've heard about this uh, throughout this uh, workshop for best practices. So we have the probability of the loading, we have the probability of the failure giving the loading, and we have the consequences given that failure. We should be building the case for each component of that formula. And um, and we can use that as a, to, to organize ourselves, but we don't want to skip any portion of that formula when we're building the case. We tend to be really good at Oh, excuse me. Uh, we tend to be really good at building the case in the probability of the failure given that loading. But don't forget that the other two components of the formula are just as important and are key parameters in understanding the risk. So we'll start off with uh, building the case with the probability of loading. So just uh, so this is an example of climate change pilot study for Friant Dam. Uh, some of the things that we want to keep in mind is, you know, when you when you're building the case, for example, I had the hydrologic loading. So what is the threshold of loading resulting in the highest risk? What is the threshold of the load when you start building on risk? So for example, do you have a threshold where you've seen good performance for the dam? 
or a threshold where uh, the dam is not loaded. For example, if you're evaluating a spillway, that threshold is gonna be the uh, crest elevation, for example. Or if you uh, don't have load on a pier or a gate or something like that. So establishing those thresholds of performance or thresholds of highest risk can be really important to um, building the case and explaining that case to the decision makers. Um, it's important to evaluate uncertainty of basin and average rainfall frequency, the variation in the rainfall runoff parameters and input, inputs, discuss why the shape and magnitude of the hazard curve makes sense. Show evidence, show different lines of evidence corroborating each other. So, you know, we've we've gotten a little bit better doing this through the years, but um, early on, we could see how we had hazard curves that didn't necessarily match the dam. For example, if you had a gated spillway, we didn't see how that uh, flood frequency curve was um, um, becoming. So it was. Uh, becoming more flat as you had those gates opening. So just make sure that what you're showing makes sense for the conditions that you have, that you're expecting, that you're discussing what the dam is sensitive to. Um, is it certain combinations of, of rainfall at certain times of the year with snow melt, for example? Um, just make sure that you're explaining the conditions that are driving risk. That also becomes important ex for another example is the seismic hazard curve. So what becomes important at the site that you're evaluating? Are uh, Where is the seismic source? Is it random? Is it a subduction zone event? Is it an active or not active uh, crustal fault? Is it induced by people? So is it an induced seismic hazard? Um, just discuss all these parameters that really are driving the loading that you're evaluating at that case. Um, is the risk driven by more remote events? Is the risk driven by events that can occur with um, more common return periods? So just keep in mind all those things when you're evaluating the dam. So for example, in you know, for when we're evaluating seismic hazard, most of the time we're going to be um, having analyses that uses a maximum uh, credible earthquake. So understand what that MCE means. Um, it just means that it coincides with uh, usually around a 24 75 year return period, which is a 2% in a 50 year event. And it's usually about the 84th percentile event. So that is a deterministic value that in the past has been used to design the dam or that can be used in regulatory standards. But is that what we should use when we're evaluating risk? And the answer is going to be probably not. You're going to be evaluating the entire load curve in that case. So you might be looking at return periods that might extend out to 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, depending on what your conditions are at the dam, what your consequences are downstream, and you want to make sure that you are understanding where that comes from. When you're evaluating seismic events, you're going to be looking at coincident pools uh, or coincident events occurring with that seismic event. So it's a pool combined with the seismic load. So make sure that that combination of those pools makes sense, that you're not looking at something that is so remote that it's just not going to be driving risk. That can actually be information that you can use to actually screen out certain failure modes, especially in areas where the seismic risk is not high. And we've discussed that um, within uh, other presentations in this week, in this workshop about using coincident uh, pools with seismic events to be able to establish whether this can be a risk driving failure mode or not. So just make sure that you understand what um, where the risk is coming from, where the loading probability is coming from, and that it, it would be a risk driver in the at the dam that you're evaluating. 
So building the case for probability of failure given that loading. So we're going to go through a couple of examples here. So this is just uh, this is in this case, this is PFM seven. It's the spillway weir instability due to failure of the spillway apron slabs during high velocities and high stagnation pressures in the existing offsets in the joints in the apron slabs that lead to sliding of the spillway pier. So in other words, this is a failure of the apron slabs leading to erosion that causes a sliding instability of the OG section. So this is, for example, a failure mode that requires uh, multiple disciplines. So make sure that when you're building the case, you're emphasizing the evidence that is available in those multiple disciplines. So for example, you could have um, you could have information based on construction records and drawings and design details that you might have a lack of of uh, detailing and, and mechanisms and 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 uh, preventative measures that were taken during construction to prevent this failure mode occurring. Uh, so that would be the structural um, engineer that would evaluate that. Um, but you have geologic conditions that may exacerbate this failure mode through erosion and the probability of having an erosive foundation. Uh, look at uh, work with your geotechnical engineer and your geologist in the probability of erosion. You would be working with your hydraulic engineer, your hydrologist or your hydraulic structures engineer and evaluating what the flow over your OG section and what the forces on the OG section might be. So just make sure that you're looking at all those points and all those uh, all that information when you're building the case for a failure mode like this. So this is going to go through just the event tree in this case and how you would build the case using that event tree and using the nodes in that event tree to uh, um, communicate the risk in this case. So in this case, node one is the reservoir load and, and we don't have it shown here. Um, but then you would move on to node two, which the claim in node two is, is that you have high velocity flows and stagnation pressures that uplift a slab. So what would be the, the evidence that supports that claim? In this case, it would be the lack of design details that, that you um, don't have dowels, for example, that you don't have interlocking slabs, that uh, you don't have reinforcement that goes through the joints, that your detailing doesn't support that offset and preventing that offset from happening. You might off have offsets already at the site. Uh, you might have CFD uh, analysis information or lab test data or a physical model data that supports that you're going to have this high likelihood that you might have these slabs uh, offset and fail. Uh, node three, the claim is, is that the exposed foundation scours and erodes leading to a progressive failure of upstream slabs to, and it progresses to this toe of the structure. So what the evidence for this node would be is past performance supporting a high likelihood that the clay shale foundation will scour. You can use geologic information, you can use uh, test data, you can use um, previous um, past performance at other dams with similar foundation. Uh, you can use case histories in this case. There is a large amount of information that can be used here. An example in this case is, let's say this 1982 event was reported to have eroded a seven to eight foot uh, area downstream of the spillway slab. So in this case, we have an example of poor performance in the past. Node four and node five in this, in this case are together. The claim here being that a crack along the upstream face of the dam results in increased uplift pressures on the structure 
and the foundation shear resi resistance is exceeded and the monolith displaces downstream. So this is the, st the stability analysis performed by your structural engineer. Um, so here is where your structural and your geo geotech engineer or your geologists work together to establish what those shear strengths are in the foundation. And then here, the, the information that would be used to, to the evidence that is used here is whether you have uh, drains to um, relieve some of that uplift, what those posometers, what that information, what that past performance has told you about drain efficiency and uplift pressures at the site, and then you evaluate the dam through analysis and potentially sensitivity analysis and what the shear strengths are. And it gives you an information information about what your factors of safety for sliding are if, at this dam. Node six, the claim here is that the 3D resistance along those monolith cross sections, along those concrete, uh, along those concrete uh, monoliths is exceeded and displacements of multiple monoliths occurs. So here you can either do an analysis, a 3D analysis that gives you information about what that um, 3D, um, 3D effects are. We have past performance. We know that dams have failed in this manner due to a, a low shear strength and erosion downstream. And that's what you use to build the case that this could occur at the site that you're evaluating. So moving on to consequences and how to build the consequences given that a failure is going to occur. And you know, you you ask yourself these questions. So, and this is and this is an area where we've failed in the past, and a lot of times it's brought up when we are presenting this to our dam safety oversight group. Is, you know, how many people are exposed to the flood? Um, how those people are distributed in that area downstream? Uh, how those people can be redistributed through evacuation? Where are those evacuation sites? Like, where are those people moving to? Are they uh, moving to a school or an area that is potentially in the floodplain and will get inundated for certain cases? How severe is the flooding? How widespread is the flooding? How does that flooding affect the main corridors that would be used for evacuations? Um, what are those structures like that people are using potentially to shelter in place? Do they have the ability to go to a second story? Um, you know, all these questions become really important in, in building the case that potentially you might um, be putting people in a, in a situation that they might not be able to evacuate. Um, how uh, how are you communicating to people downstream that there is a um, imminent danger? For example, one of the things that we evaluate uh, during a seismic failure mode is could those people be potentially getting um, conflicting information? So you might be getting information on that you have a flood downstream and your best thing would be to shelter in place. Or you might have a, a let's say, information that you should be evacuating to a, to a certain location. But let's say you have a seismic event um, that has led to this breach downstream, you might have a lot of your infrastructure that's not really able to support that ev evacuation to that location. So there's a lot of things that we have to think through about what conditions are we putting that population downstream in? How that population downstream is receiving the message? What that population downstream looks like? What the age of that population downstream is? How um, are they able to evacuate? For example, do you have a large hospital downstream? Do you have a residence for um, a senior population? So all those things contribute to the loss of life. In addition to breach time, warning time, all the items that we tend to explain and do a lot of sensitivity analysis for, but we also have to make sure that we're communicating and explaining and um, 
it just explaining the telling the story basically to our decision makers. So when we're doing this, we're really building the argument of whether we feel like we need it. Oops, sorry. Whether we feel like we need further study for to make certain decisions for this dam. So when the confidence in our recommendations, when the confidence in our risk estimate is low, such that additional information can change the perceived risk or that any new information can change what that perceived risk is, we should recommend further study. Um, we do not want to make decisions that any information could change or certain information could change what the decision is. I guess the, ca the caveat in that is we don't want to be spending too much time and money investigating if that further study is not going to make a considerable change to what that decision would be in the future, or if the cost of just taking that remedial action is small enough that it just doesn't really make sense to go into further study. So if we're moving the mean estimate up or down and it changes how that failure mode graphs against our tolerable risk guidelines, then that is something that we really uh, should be evaluating. So this is just an example of where further investigations would be needed. So this FN chart shows that this failure mode, the mean uh, graph just above tolerable risk guidelines, this societal risk guideline, but there was large uncertainty here in this case. Um, this was an example of liquefaction uh, triggered by a seismic failure. And although the, the estimate showed us that this failure mode wasn't tolerable, when you looked into the information that drove that risk estimate, there was a lot of uncertainty in this case. So in this case, it was very sensitive to the blow count. The mean in this case was 16, but the standard deviation was eight. So it gave you a lot of a, a, a large distribution that was used in this analysis. The boreholes weren't really in the best locations. So it was really being driven by information that wasn't really adequate for the, for the, the type of decision that we were making in this case. This was it, the, the action that would have been taken, the recommendation that would have been taken, the repair was actually very costly in this case. And the, the cost to for further exploration was small in comparison. So it was really um, kind of a no brainer to really go into further study and get additional borings and do some additional field investigation at the site. So the original drill holes here were on the downstream toe of the dam here shown in green and the recommended additional boreholes are here shown in red. There was strong evidence that um, that this recommend the recommendation would it change potentially change the uh, estimated risk because of the sensitivity analysis that had been done by the team as part of the um, kind of recommendation to do this further study. Uh, 22 boreholes were uh, recommended and um, the team thought that the blow counts would uh, change the, the uh, or these, uh, that these 22 locations would change the blow counts because the dewatering of soils near the cutoff trench to rock and load imposed by the dam may contribute to higher blow counts. And this is really where liquefaction is occurring that would um, potentially have a um, lead to failure of the dam and breach. So in this case, after a field investigation was done, the mean estimate actually dropped by more than an order of magnitude and the recommendation changed to no action for this case. So this is an example where, oops, sorry, where uncertainty in this case was tolerable 
and where the risk that was estimated was deemed to be tolerable. So in this case, the mean was below that societal risk guideline. And although we had a large uncertainty, that uncertainty really didn't change the outcome. It still uh, remained that the decision makers believed that this risk, I mean, this failure mode was tolerable. And that although the confidence wasn't great, it really didn't change the action. So building the case, an example of how we would build the case. Here the claim is, is that the lift joints near the spillway crest are well bonded and have a significant tensile strength. This leads to a low likelihood of cracking through the section at a certain seismic event. In this case, it was one in 10,000 year event or lower or smaller ground motions. So but the evidence in this case was that there was no evidence of leaking lift lines in this critical area. All the lift joints near the spillway elevation that where um, cores had been taken were uh, intact. There were large numbers of tests indicating high tensile strength across the lift joints. Um, you would want to report what those numbers were and the data from those reports. Uh, construction control procedures were excellent, and that would give you information from the original construction um, that was what they had done, what their procedures were, and then that the stresses based on these um, seismic accelerations and the seismic loading are less than the estimated strength across that block and what those numbers are. Another example of building the case for no action here is the claim that the chimney drain material filters the impervious fill. This along with other favorable factors leads to a low likelihood of failure. The evidence here would be gradation tests show that filter criteria is met. There was a large number of tests. You would report the number. Zone two material doesn't easily segregate, show that calculation, and then describe what the construction control procedures were. Here, note that filtering is a key node in an internal erosion failure mode and in a key and a key defense in the in design as it renders most of this failure mode harmless. So this would be a main consideration to take in this failure mode as an example. So arguments for not taking action. So you just, you know, estimated risk justifies risk reduction actions. So just make sure that your um, estimated risk is really what is going to drive what your arguments are for action, whether those risks are above tolerable risk guidelines or below tolerable risk guidelines. Consideration of uncertainty related to the mean or expected value supports that risk reduction action. And then the confidence is high, so no further studies are necessary. So, so these are all things that you would take into account to take action. So there is no inform additional information that would change that decision. Your uncertainty is um, uh, still keeps you above tolerable risk guidelines information, new information wouldn't necessarily change the answer. So these are all, this is all information that you would use to build that case to the decision makers that the analysis that you have, that the information that you have is really adequate to go ahead and move forth into a dam safety study. So a co coherence check, um, you know, it's important for us as a team to make sure that we are allowing ourselves to do make this gut check. Um, a lot of times for the core that is done in, through the quality control and uh, um, QCC process, the quality control and consistency process, where they have charge questions that they ask the team as to like, you know, are there risk in analysis? the risk analyses and uncertainty adequately explained and portrayed. Do the portrayal and level of risk agree with the understanding of the project condition and its ability to withstand potential loads, potential future loads based on the information provided? 
what key information leads you to believe that the risk estimates are reasonable or not. So we don't have to wait to QCC to ask, ask ourselves those questions. You need to go to, to ask yourself those questions as you go and as you're building the case through the risk estimate. Um, you need to build that case and do that gut check, like I mentioned, through each of those three components of risk, not just the analysis and probability of failure, but do it through the loading and the consequences. Do the level and portrayal of risk support the actions that you're recommending to reduce or better define risks? An example of this is I was working on a dam, seismic loading, the risk was high. And one of the recommended actions that we were evaluating was a, a pool restriction. So one of the questions that we asked ourselves as a team was, well, pool restriction is pretty, uh, it's a pretty big recommendation to make, especially in the in the in a dam that's used for hydropower. So if if we believe that the risk is that high, why wouldn't we take any action to reduce that risk to the population downstream? In this case, it was a really easy way to take to reduce that risk because you're taking away some of that pool. And the pool restriction really wasn't all that that large. It was maybe five to eight feet. So we asked ourselves, are we willing to go down this route that's not very popular of a potential a pool restriction to reduce risk? And if we're not, then we need to ask ourselves, do we really believe that the risks are that high? And if we don't, then we need to go back to the drawing board and determine where we're missing the mark why the numbers are not working out and how our, uh, we're graphing that failure mode within our FN chart against our tolerable risk guidelines. So some key takeaway points. The dam safety case, use structured arguments to develop, oh, sorry, structured argue, okay. Adam, I'm gonna start this one again. Okay, key takeaway points here the dam safety case, structured arguments developed to have the facilities condition, risk estimates and recommended actions make sense. Make sure that you are taking the decision maker with you through the story of the risk estimate. Show the evidence as to why it is reasonable to believe the risk and the APF numbers do not use the risk value as a sole basis. Do not use just numbers as the sole basis for your recommendations, that they will not like that. And remember, you may not be presenting to engineers of that specific discipline. If you have a geotech or a structural failure mode, you will be presenting to people that are not in that same discipline. So if you can't explain it to another member of your team that is not of that same discipline, you may not be able to present it to the entire DSOG um, group. So remember that. Key, remember that you're not presenting for people that get down into the weeds in that particular failure mode. So break down those concepts and use just conversational language to present what the risks are. Fully develop the justification to take action or that no action is needed. If you don't feel comfortable recommending that, then you probably haven't built the case enough for that action that you're recommending. You probably don't have the justification to do it. So do it again and strengthen it. Address the sensitivity of the mean to the key parameters, the likelihood of a change justification class and likelihood of success when recommending additional studies to reduce uncertainty. Don't wait to the last minute to recommend further study if needed, to show that sensitivity to a certain parameter that you might not have information. That decision 
to go off to further study or field investigation can be done at any moment in a risk assessment. Do not wait until you're in front of your decision makers or until you're in front of your QCC panel to recommend that. That potentially could be too late and you've wasted potentially months that you could have been doing that risk analysis. So this is just a quick quote from Greg Scott. Uh, hopefully you guys know who he is. He was one of our lead civil engineers, which I had um, the wonderful opportunity to work with throughout the years. But cite the evidence that supports the case for why the risk estimate makes sense and therefore why the recommendation makes sense. If your risk estimate doesn't make sense, your recommendation doesn't make sense and vice versa. If your recommendation doesn't make sense, then you probably don't have a justified case. It's that simple. Thank you very much.